This is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio, and very happy to be here tonight on this Wednesday night. Uh, there is, uh, well, I guess all hell breaking loose. That's what they're saying in the Middle East. I don't know if that is actually true. <laughs> I just green-lighted a trip to, to Egypt on top of it, so I guess my timing is impeccable, as always. Uh, <laughs> very, very interesting turn of affairs. Uh, wow, what can we say? Uh, it, it, is, it is a bizarre time that we're living in, no doubt about it. I have a, a really fabulous guest this evening. Susan Lindauer is my guest, and I am very, very, very proud to have her on the show and uh, and excited as well because this is going to be a great opportunity for people to hear her story and also I want to encourage people to buy her book. I have been reading her book and find it absolutely fascinating. It's a, a real inside look at, um, well, you might say an intelligence asset and we're going to ask her more about how she likes to characterize herself at least back in those days and then maybe more so what she's doing nowadays she did go to prison uh, under the patriot act and and for that reason alone this is going to be a fascinating interview because as many people will know uh due to to some add-ons onto this patriot act recently people like me are are easy prey and other other truth tellers and so on so if if you don't mind i i would like you to encourage you to buy her book and support the cause in that way at, at, at the very minimum. And then, of course, there are other ways to get involved. As you can appreciate, um, we have a crazy time going on now. I think we have a solar eclipse as well. And I, I want to say that there's uh, been some some things going on in the Middle East. And there's also been a coup in the American government. <laughs> so I don't know. We couldn't have a more, uh, I guess, you you know, from depending on your perspective, a more exciting I guess backdrop to to the show, and and let me say that I'm not going to read her bio, but I'm going to direct you to the front page of Camelot where you can link to the bio. It's actually I chose the bio that was on Veterans Today. I hope that's okay. And Susan, are you there? I'm right here. I'm delighted by all the great things you're saying. <laughs> I wish I was going to Egypt with you. Oh well, that would be that would be really amazing. Okay, I wish you were too. <laughs> So at this point, what I'd like you to do is, is give yourself a background. Uh, tell a little bit about your story. Um, I know people may have heard you interviewed other places, so maybe we don't have to go down too many of those roads. But at least to start off with for the people that are, are tuning in now and uh, might not know of your name and, and your background. Sure. And I hope that this will be a little bit different in the sense that um, – uh, I, I was a, C, uh, a general audience knows that I was a CIA intelligence asset, but I'd like to address these comments more to an intelligence audience, um, and I think that your your audience will be uh, will have a, a specialized knowledge so that we can go past. The, the platitudes and the, the, the generalities and talk specifics, um, because I, I see, uh, if I may be so bold, a lot of similarities between what's happened to me and, and the General Petraeus case, ironically. Um, certainly mine was not a love affair, but it was a scapegoat situation, and I, have, uh, uh, I am burning <laughs> with rage for, with un- unhappiness over what they have done to him, uh, though I am not... Uh, uh, I am an anti-war asset. Um, I have a different political philosophy, but I am keenly sensitive to the FBI sabotaging someone's career for uh, an, uh, an ulterior agenda. And we're going to talk, at, 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 at I hope, in, in more depth about that tonight and to show uh, how the FBI is attacking the CIA to uh, undermine operational authority. So... Um, as you're listening to my story, just you know, in the back of your mind, file away that, Port, that General Petraeus is is suffering something that is it's being presented as one thing to the public, uh, but behind the scenes, there's got to be something more going on. Um, there's a mo- there's a reason why this has been done to him, and and you and I just don't know what it is yet, and we may not know for a lot for a while. Uh, we may never know. But I don't believe for a minute that, that he's been attacked for the reasons they say, and that's because of my experience. So 
Uh, let, let me let me preface it that way. Okay, um, Susan. Let me just in terms of sound quality, uh, maybe if you could back off your mic a little bit. There is there is getting some interference. I'm not sure why, uh, okay. but otherwise you're you're perfectly clear. Uh, just just a few um, sort of interactive things going on with the mic. So, sure. Um, so it will help if you back off just a little, um, but but keep the volume at the same level, and hopefully the tech will be able to help that as well. Um, but thank you for that. Yes, you know, I want to go into the Petraeus matter. I, I have just written an article about that, and I also, um, I'm, I'm trying to do more investigations along those lines. Uh, it would be wonderful to get your insight, and, uh, and there's no doubt in my mind that this is, uh, this is quite complex. So it will be fascinating to see where we can go with that. Um, but before we do that, if we could like I said, sort of start out with your bio uh, from the background of what happened to you and how you ended up in prison, etc. Sure. I was, uh, for, for many years, uh, the CIA asset and defense intelligence asset covering the Iraq embassy at the United Nations from 1995 until 2003. I also covered the Libya House. I did the Lockerbie negotiations with Libya's diplomats. I did the weapons inspections talks with Iraq. Um, though, we, though I'm not going to go into all the details of 9-11, my team did give advance warning about the 9-11 attack. Uh, uh, we received information from the CIA, and I was ordered to contact the Iraqi embassy and demand intelligence, which Iraq did not possess. But the Bush administration, of course, wanted to pretend they possessed it. So I was part of, I was, um, uh, when, when the government decided to rewrite the history books and Congress and the war, the war was, going, was starting to go very badly, uh, Congress needed to erase the truth of the actions, um, which was, some of which we'll talk about tonight. Um, and I made a fatal mistake. I went through proper channels, and I requested to testify on Capitol Hill. I contacted the offices of Senator Trent Lott and Senator John McCain. Because People say, why did you do that? And it was because I was not doing what a Bradley Manning. Uh, I was performing in a proper function. Uh, I knew the, the, the proper procedures, and I was following them. <laughs> and I asked to testify, and they said, well, what will you tell us? And I, and I outlined uh, the real facts of Iraqi pre-war intelligence, which are very different than what you were ever told. Uh, and 30 days later, I woke up in the morning to hear the FBI pounding on my door. I looked out the window, and there were, you know, a dozen men in flak jackets standing on my porch and in my yard, and they, uh, I was arrested on the Patriot Act, and I became the second non-Arab American after Jose Padilla to be re arrested. I was subjected to secret. We'll talk about. We'll talk about what that means tonight. It's it's a frightening story. Okay. Uh, well, yes, and that that's a, a really short short version. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, it, it's extraordinary, and you must have, uh, you know, actually, I haven't finished your book, so I don't know how you actually got yourself out of jail. <laughs> so maybe mm -hmm. you can come for that. <laughs> well, uh, well, the, the, the reason the reason they put me in, uh, and and the way that it ties to General Petraeus is that the FBI was covering up our team's nine eleven warnings to the Justice Department. Um, and this is very dirty because uh, they, were, they were protecting the, the, the White House and they were protecting Congress and the lies invented by the Congress about the weapons of mass destruction and how it was very... It, the story that... They, Congress had a story they wanted to tell the people. It just happened to be entirely false. There was not a single word that was true. Uh, Congress denied vehemently that we had ever anticipated the 9-11 attack, and Congress also denied vehemently that uh, the CIA ever spoke up to say there would be no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, 
and to deny that there was any option other than war that would have solved the problem. The, the, and and, and the, the, the reason that was a, that was a difficulty, that I was a, a scapegoat, was that, and, and, and it was necessary to destroy me utterly, was that I personally had negotiated um, a comprehensive peace framework with the Iraqi government. We had the weapons inspections, which everyone knew about, but we also had a number of other very valuable things. We had permission from Baghdad before 9-11 to send an FBI task force into Iraq with authorization to conduct terrorism investigations, interview witnesses outside the, the province of the government, and to make arrests as required. Uh, after 9-11, the Iraqi government tried, tried very hard to give the United States financial documents that would have identified the pipeline, the cash pipeline, feeding terrorism globally. From the Middle East to Indonesia to the Philippines, uh, we would have been able to shut down the money. And if you shut down the money, you don't need a war. You've taken away their, their operating budget, and you can, you can cramp their style pretty good that way. Uh, and the Iraqis, want, had all, throughout the 90s, the Iraqis were one of the best sources that we had on terrorism intelligence. Saddam was obsessive about these people. He was convinced that any uh, jihadi would automatically become a terrorist. Um, okay, uh, Susan, I have to interrupt you there. Uh, thank you for all of that. And we'll be right back uh, after this break with Susan Lindauer. Hi there. This is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio. And uh, we're talking to Susan Lindauer. Susan, are you there? Hi, I'm right Hi, here, Carrie. Right? Carrie. Very good. All right. So where we were at, uh, actually, you were you were talking right before the we went to break. And uh, do you want to complete that thought? Yes, I, I just want to say, ex explain what the peace option was about, because there was so much more that the Ira the Americans. The CIA was, was demanding from Iraq than just weapons inspections. And so many times people think that, that, that there was some ulterior excuse for this war. And so it's, it's important to know what we covered and, and why and, and, and to understand how the FBI has, in this conversation, I think, how the FBI has been viciously attacking the CIA and for what purposes and mine is so loaded with you know all these great things that our our team was doing um, that were all good for the United States I subsequently was accused of being an Iraqi agent so keep in mind as you listen to this uh, when the government decided to destroy my career you know, I was at the top of my game. I had already done the Lockerbie negotiations. The weapons inspections, you all know, went off beautifully. I negotiated that. I'm the one who worked out the kinks with the Iraqi government to make sure that it would succeed. Everything I had done was superior. We, even before 9-11, nine months before 9-11, we had an invitation for the FBI to go into Baghdad, but the Bush administration... Uh, refused to send them. And so there's a cover-up. There's complicity with the FBI and the, and the Bush administration trying to hide the failure of the FBI uh, and trying to blame everything on the CIA. It was supposed to be our fault that there was no discovery of the 9-11 attack. Well, that was nonsense. I personally had known about 9-11 since April and May of 2001. I was ordered to threaten the... I was ordered by my CIA handler to threaten Iraqi diplomats with war at the order of George... Uh, that the threat originated above the CIA director and above the Secretary of State. And that was the wording I was told to use. The highest levels of government above the CIA director and the Secretary of State. That's only three people, George Bush, Dick Cheney, and Donald Rumsfeld. And that meant that they knew about the 9-11 conspiracy, if you believe that there were hijackings or not. Uh, I personally believe that it was a combination, that it was that the airplane hijackings was a cover for the, the controlled demolition because they needed to maximize the destruction of the towers 
and guarantee that they could have such a compelling interest, a compelling uh, interest is not the right word, um, uh, they, they could overcome public resistance, which would be fierce. And they wanted to, to maximize uh, the, the impact, the psychological impact of damage to the American psyche so that they could thrust us into this. The Patriot Act was already in, in somebody's, in John Hughes' drawer, 7,000 pages that pretty much replicates the Soviet criminal code of 1926 under Joseph Stalin, the KGB network, secret charges. Think about this. Think about what it means to be a defendant. I've lived through this. Secret charges where you're not allowed to know what you are accused of doing. You're not allowed to know the type of crime that you might have committed. They are not required to give you, uh, they, can, they give you a general date, but they don't have to be specific. They do not have to tell you what city the crime occurred in. They do not have to give you an address just in case you were across town or in a different place that, uh, on that date. They do not have to identify the accusers, secret charges, secret evidence. They do not have to prove the crime ever even occurred. Like if you rob a bank, the bank has a video of the bank robber going into the bank, holding up the teller, maybe using a gun or not, and they can, they, they, there's evidence that shows that a crime actually occurred. In the Patriot Act, none of that is required. Not only that, you have secret uh, grand jury testimony. And this is very scary stuff. I was never allowed in five years to know who had accused me of what actions and I, I, I was, uh, in, in fact, I was accused, and, and your audience will, will be aghast. Uh, my cousin was the chief of staff to George Bush, Andrew Card. He did receive copies of my letters. So did the CIA, and so did Colin Powell. In fact, we had, uh, thanks to the FBI investigation, we had the Manila envelope, Copies, sorry, we had, we had the photocopies, the bait, bait with Bates numbers on them, that's for a legal prosecution, the photocopy of the manila envelope and my handwritten notes to Colin Powell, proving that I had gone to him a week before his speech at the United Nations, telling him that there would be no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and that he should discredit everything the Iraqi exiles were telling him because they were notorious liars they were trying to engage the United States in their protection as they returned to Baghdad because nobody was going to support them when they got there. And okay, so I was totally right about everything I said. Okay, and, and once again, asking you to back off a little bit from your mic there because oh, uh, there's, there's some static happening when you emphasize a word. <laughs> Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, thank you. That this this is uh, you know excellent material, and and I really appreciate it. Uh, as far as the Patriot Act, uh, do you recall that the the powers that have been expanded since uh, since you were you were sort of put in jail under it? Yes. Um, I was sort of a guinea pig for the Patriot Act in the worst imaginable ways. Uh, I was locked up on Carswell Air Force Base uh, with no hearing or trial. And I, w I was forced to stay in prison for a year while we fought. The, we fought it very hard to, for my release. While I was inside, um, the government... The Justice Department urged that I should be detained indefinitely, up to 10 years with no he trial or guilty plea and no That's hearing, funny. no evidentiary hearing at all. Um, and uh, I, while I was there, as as, uh, okay, my uncle, those, who is... I'm sorry, sorry, as far as those powers, the expanded powers... Did that, did, were you affected by those expanded powers? I mean, it sounds like they didn't even, uh, I don't even know. I mean, it, it sounds like they basically treated you as though you were a Guantanamo prisoner, right? Yeah, pretty much. 
Pretty much. Um, the way they got the way they 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 got away with it was saying that now now you you just heard what I did the the, the back my background and the evidence that was used against me. I gave advance warnings about 9-11. We had the Iraqi peace option. I negotiated the return of the weapons inspections, which went fabulously well. When the government decided, when the Justice Department decided to hide the fact that I had also contacted Attorney General John Ashcroft, his private staff, requesting inside his internal office, going beyond the, you know, the 800 number on the highway for reporting terrorism. We, you know, my team had done this work for a lot of years, and we had contact information inside, straight to the top of the Justice Department, in the Attorney General's private office, in the event that something happened and we needed to sound the alarms and try to, you know, because the terror, we, we just, I was dealing with Iraq and Libya, and maybe there would be a major attack, and I would need to get the information to the, to the top of the government, so I had, I had the proper phone numbers. Well, I used them for 9-11, um, and, I, and I asked for an emergency broadcast alert across all federal agencies. John Ashcroft's private staff told me to give that in, gave me a phone number at the Office of Counterterrorism at the Justice Department. Told me to repeat what I just said to them. Um, and but later on, when when the FBI decided to cover for John Ashcroft, and this and again, I want you to all to think about General Petraeus right now. When the general when when when. Uh, and, and whatever he's really suffering, because this is a front. This, I am absolutely convinced this is a nonsense story that they've made up about him having this ridiculous affair. Uh, and, and we can talk about that, why I think it's nonsense. I think it's very silly. Uh, I think it's tragic that he is being attacked and his career is destroyed for something so stupid. But I am convinced there's something more that's going on that they are hiding. And the reason I believe it is that I had done these things, and the Justice Department wanted to take away the CIA's authority on terrorism investigations. It was not an intelligence failure of, that, that, prevented the, that, that failed to stop the 9-11 attack. It was a Justice Department decision. John Ashcroft was warned we asked for his help, and John Ashcroft, head of law enforcement for the United States, refused to take action. And they absolutely were, were covering for his corruption, his incompetence, his mediocrity. He was out of his league. He never should have been allowed to be the head of the Justice Department. Terrible, terrible leadership. But the okay, FBI I'm, I'm wanted gonna, gonna that out. operational authority. I, I'm going to throw out a, uh, a counter to that and wonder if you, how you would approach this. If I told you that I believe John Ashcroft was acting under orders, not, not being uh, as incompetent as you may think he is, but actually that there was a more diabolical agenda uh, that he was simply following. I agree with you on that. I consider him to be traitorous. I, I, can, I, I do agree with you, yes, uh, that it was a deliberate decision. I have no doubt in my mind. And, and so when people say to me, Susan, do you think 9-11 was an inside job? I say, absolutely. Um, they let it happen and they made it happen. They made sure it would happen, and, and they did it by the combination of the explosives, demolition, and pulling off the CIA, uh, pulling off the, the law enforcement and refusing to implement requests for law enforcement help. And, and I consider it un to be, you know, because of, I, I suffered on the Patriot Act for five years. I was accused of incompetence. They said that I was, they invented a story they, that I was a religious maniac. Now, I, I do believe in God, but I am I categorically deny that I am a religious maniac. I just, that is just, anybody who knows me would know how silly that is. Though I do, I am not an atheist. But I, you know, I do have a strong sense of faith in my life and I am mindful of the greatness of this fabulous earth and universe and I'm probably more theistic or deistic 
I think I don't even know what those things mean. However, I am just not a deeply religious person. Well, I, I do believe in God. So anyway, but they, they made up this story about me, which the corporate media helped them sell. Amy Goodman, who is of you know, democracy now, when I was locked up in prison, my beloved companion phoned her and begged her to cover my story. And she said, I quote, and he broke down in tears telling me this. He's this big old Navy guy. And he said that she told him, oh, well, maybe it's for the best. Really? Yeah. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. Okay. And, well, I'm very, I, I'm very sorry to hear that. Uh, I, I, I don't want to get into disparaging another radio, you know. No, I, I know, I know, but it's, it's but, a fact. But, it's, no, it's, it's, it, it is crucial that you get this kind of information out there, and and perhaps uh, even we get possibly an apology. I'm surprised that even has she come forward and uh, you know after the fact you've written a book. Um, there's lots of evidence that you are who you say you are, and that that you were set up, etc. Has she ever? sort of come back around and apologized or whatever? Never. Never at all. The corporate media has been clinging, as we all know, has been clinging to the lies. They made up a story and they backed the administration a thousand percent. It, ha it'd be, it was a, a changing of the guard, as you know, uh, away from, uh, or we've seen, we've, it, it, through, through my experience, uh, we see a rise of the blogs and a rise of the internet radio, um, and a ri and and uh, we see that that this media becomes far more valuable and necessary. And so, when I hear you doing fundraising, people, this is listeners out there. You need to support Project Camelot because if you lose Project Camelot, you're going to never have this information at all. And you need to know what's really going on. All of us need to be a lot more astute uh, because it's 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 a lot more diabolical and malevolent than even any of us could wish in our worst nightmare that we could that you could imagine what I lived through. Yeah, uh, there there is no doubt about it, and and you're one of the the, the the people that people should most be listening to, in my opinion, in this regard. Okay, we'll be right back with Susan Lindauer. Warning. Warning. American. Warning. American Freedom Radio. This habit forming. American Freedom Radio. This habit forming. Use the truth carefully. Okay, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot, Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Susan Lindauer. Uh, and, and actually, we're just veering into this whole Petraeus thing. I, I don't know if you're quite ready to go there, but if you are, I've got a number of, you know, sort of questions and things, things to avenues I'd like to go down if, if, if you're interested. Absolutely. I think it's very important. Okay, uh, well... First of all, let me direct your attention to the fact that I wrote an article. It is on the front page of Camelot. Uh, I, I don't know if you're online or able to see it now, but maybe you can read it later. Um, and and it, you will find it of interest. Uh, I, I basically sort of find a, a number of articles out there. One of, uh, one of the sources on the stories out there comes from a guy named Tom Hennigan, and he is an in intelligence asset, as you would call them. Uh, I don't. I forget which agency I'm, he's with. Maybe it is the CIA. Um, I don't know if everything he's saying is is straight. There's often disinfo wrapped in with things, as you know. Um, yes. And and that's that's purposeful. Sometimes, in in fact, to keep the guy uh, alive. But nonetheless, um, it, it does appear that that where there's smoke, there's fire. In the sense that this situation is a lot bigger than they're letting on, and. Uh, and I'm getting back, you know, I get whistle test, blower testimony all the time. I am getting back channel information to the effect that, in essence, this is a coup uh, that was orchestrated. And I have to say, um, it, it would have possibly been a good coup. In other words, it, it might have been um, a group of, of generals, et cetera, et cetera, who, who got together and were planning something to go up against the Bush cabal that is now running this government and has been for, for some time. Um, and I'm just wondering... Yes, 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 yes. Keep going. 
So, I agree 100%. Okay. Uh, well, just, I, I've actually, I mean, we can really get into it because I've actually been sent some names uh, recently also of, of some people that aren't even uh, out on the, the, the sort of um, the media at the moment as having been also arrested. And, and there are a number of people being uh, made to step down. In other words, I'm getting lots and lots of rumblings coming to me. And uh, I have to say, even if this coup fails, uh, I have to say there may be some other ones in the wings because I get information to this effect all the time. From well, now, let me ask you, are they saying that General Petraeus is part of the Bush cabal or are they saying he's against the Bush cabal? Well, no, they're saying he would have been the leader of the coup against going against the Bush cabal. That's what I think. That's how I see it, too. Yes. That is exactly how I see it. Um, and, and this might help a little bit, uh, of course, just to historical context. The Bush administration had gutted the intelligence community uh, and tried to deeply politicize it so that everything, that all intelligence reporting would, affir- would be affirming the, 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 the Republican pers- view of the world. And this, was, this, was, uh, this is anathema to any professional intelligence person you're supposed to lay it out straight you you have it it's classified for a reason you have to be able to give uh, a blunt warnings you have to provide the most accurate details uh in your in your debriefings without fear of reprisal and so you want to have the most ca- the greatest candor that you can and under bush they 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 punished anyone who even privately put out these reports or privately like you know confidentially covertly gave these reports that didn't jibe with what the government was trying to say so they were definitely politicizing intelligence and i have seen petraeus as as going back to the uh, and also the fbi and and this is very important the fbi had been taking away the CIA's operational programs. They had been taking over the role performed by the CIA. And um, under Leon Panetta, he had restored the, he'd done a lot of work to restore the morale of the agency, but Petraeus was taking it a big step further, which was to restore the operational performance. And really, the CIA has been rising. I perceive, anyway, has been rising like an rising out of the ashes and resurrecting itself. Um, Whether you like the CIA or not, that's what they've been doing more and more. And I know of some operations that would have been unthinkable three or four years ago because the CIA was incapacitated. And 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 as you know, and, and unfortunately, I can't discuss exactly what those are because they're active. But uh, and you don't want to undercut those things. But there's operational. But but the the operational integrity of the agency has 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 become a threat to the power that the FBI has usurped. And so I think that there's like an obsession with taking out the people who are threatening the FBI's budget, among other things. Okay, well, uh, let me throw this uh, sort of uh, in front of you and see see how you react. Uh, I'm getting some back-channel information basically saying that there are uh, military commander and commanders and generals, um, a flag-level commander uh, in the Navy, and uh, a, a staff-level general are now in custody of the U.S. military police. Oh. Um, and uh, and I and my source on this is very very good, um, and there is something to do with a rapid rise in silver and gold, uh, with the dollar at the same time being highly threatened, uh, and it also sort of extends to a, a basically a political b- breakup of the United States. I mean, we're talking some very serious stuff here. It's it is. I think it's interesting that you characterize it as something of a of a war between the FBI and the CIA, I would like to say that I understand, the way I understand it, is there's a split within the CIA also, and, uh, and, and maybe, you know, more than one, one split, certainly. But, but from what I understand, there are some good guys in the CIA um, and in a number of agencies, but they are, uh, we call them white hats, kind of lumping them together. Sure. 
Um, but but so so do you? How do you react to to the notion that that there may be something uh, like a real coup, not just a philosophical coup, uh, but a, but an actual uh, military takedown? Right. Yeah. Wow. Um, that is uh, that that uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Um, the gold and silver and the fall of the dollar and the fear of the breakup of the United States. I I perceive that we have um, some military who are in it to, in the military who have taken this oath of service very seriously, who would protect the American citizens uh, at all costs. You know, enemies, foreign and domestic, and domestic. Right. And if we are moving towards a state of martial law, which you see over and over again, um, posse comitatus is in serious trouble. Uh, not only the NDAA, and I'll talk about my experience on the NDAA because I've lived it. I have lived it, uh, and it is a scary thing. And, and it's it's scary in ways that you have no offense, Carrie, but. Your audience just doesn't understand. You, you think you understand the NDAA. You don't have a clue how bad it really is. Um, but well, Enlighten us. I, you know, I'm happy to hear more about this. Uh, you know. Well, well let, me, let me just tell you that, um, let, let me give you an ex- a specific example. My uncle, who, when I was on Carswell Air Force Base, uh, the reason I was on an Air Force Base, in pr- there is a private prison, A corporate, now here's the thing, remember that that it's corporate, (laughs) Um, and then we're going to come back, after I explain this, I want to come back to the brand new uh, executive order that has been hushed up uh, by the Obama administration, because there's a brand new order that follows on the NDAA. Uh, But my uncle, who is an attorney with 40 years of experience, came when I was locked up, was bless his heart, great, wonderful man, thank God for him, came to see me to try to save me. And he jumped in. I had a public defender who I was so poor I couldn't afford uh, a, a, a fancy private attorney, but I had a family member who helped me. He came to the base. And first thing the military said, remember the NDAA now, the first thing they said was, Mr. Lindauer, there is no prison on this base, and there is no Susan Lindauer anywhere on our facility. And he said, that, excuse me, sir, uh, Mr. Sentry, that's, that's not true. I have the papers from the court ordering her to surrender here. Here they are. She's here. And I have letters from here, her postmarked from your base. Here they are. Take a look. And the military called the commanding officer who came out, looked him straight in the eye and said, you're wrong. There's no prison here. She's not located here either. Get off our base right now. Leave immediately, sir. My uncle's 70 years old. He's not, a, he's not like a hippie dressed in blue jeans and tie-dye. He, he's wearing a three-piece suit. <laughs> and he's a gentleman. He's, like, he's, a, he's an elderly, dignified gentleman. And he's a Republican, <laughs> which is really kind of funny. Um, but he is, you know, he's, very, he, he, he's the type of human being who all of his life has trusted authority. And we'll, we'll, I'm sorry, we'll come back to this and we'll talk about what happened to get him onto the base. Sorry. Okay, well, this, I have to say that what happened to you must have been an eye-opener for him. Uh, we'll be right back with Susan Lindauer. Hi there, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Susan Lindauer. Uh, we've actually started to go down the road of what is really going on with, uh, well, Petraeus, uh, the, what, what I'm calling a, a frame, uh, and, and possibly a frame of other generals as well, what appears to be uh, a coup that, that was being orchestrated against the Bush cabal. That, that's the most I've got at the moment, uh, but it is being hidden from the American people. It's kind of amazing. They can have coups go on in our government, and, and unlike South America that, that has this go on all the time, uh, our government, the whole thing is, is secret. It's, it's hidden, and it's hidden under, uh, as usual, a sex scandal, a so-called sex scandal. So 
this is uh, complete nonsense in my be- belief. And uh, I have to say that um, that even if there were uh, sort of sexual relations between the individuals involved, they're all uh, consenting adults. And, and so, you know, uh, fuck it all. Um, they're, they're actually, they should be uh, able to do whatever they wish. And, and, and this kind of thing of washing their laundry in public is, is absolutely absurd. And the, and the American Puritan audience listening to this kind of thing and leaping after that and not call it paying more attention to what's really going on in their government. And then the media, who are even worse, because they should be intelligent enough and educated enough with, uh, with the political scene to know what's really going on. And yet they lie through their teeth on a regular basis. It's just amazing to me. Um, so, Susan, what what are you you basically thinking along the lines? I mean, we, we had start. Yeah, I, I want to. Yeah, I want to come back to General Petraeus. I'm sorry, I got off on the NDAA. No, I mean, uh, it, it's you. You get the emotion for me because I've lived through an attack like this, and the corruption that is necessary to pull something like this off is is it, 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 even now when I relive it in my mind, I get very emotional. So, Carrie, I apologize because I lose my perspective when I start to thinking like this. But, but there is a, new, a brand new executive order that has been suppressed in the media. And I think that it could be very important. Um, it is that there will be a corporate partnership with Homeland Security to manage resources in the event of martial law. And that is bringing corporations, empowering corporations. Uh, we've, we've said that corporate, the, the, the Supreme Court has said corporations are, have personhood, and now we're saying that they have rights of government officials to, to detain citizens to implement the NDAA. The corporations will be part of the Homeland Security Detention Program, and that there will be a partnership. In uh, that there was also a, a second and third uh, uh, executive order back in, I guess it was March after the NDAA, when it talked about privatizing, uh, or excuse me, seizing private resources, like seizing food production resources, uh, energy, transportation, and that all of that could be diverted to military uses against the will of the civilians. Well, now they've taken it another step farther. Then we knew that the, excuse me, the Department of Homeland Security had come up with a manual for running these, these NDAA camps, where they would, how they would identify um, um, uh, ringleaders and, and activists and single out the people who would be most influential within the group who would try to lead dissidents uh, away d- to resist the NDAA practices in the camp and they would be put in solitary confinement and a procedure for breaking their spirit. I have lived through this. I was threatened with forcible drugging with Haldol, Ativan, and Prozac, trying to force me to recant my 9-11 warnings and the Iraqi peace option. At the same time, you, the public, were told that the reason I was being threatened with forcible drugging was that I was a religious maniac, and I was suffering delusions of of hallucinations and crazy things. Uh, I'm amazed by these things. I don't even know what a hallucination would be or what hearing voices would be. I have no idea what that's like. Uh, I've never never happened in my entire in my existence that I'm aware of. <laughs> you know, they they tried to say that I at one point they tried to say that I was suicidal, but I didn't know it. And that's how they got me into the um, the the psychology framework uh, to begin with. And I was like, "That's ridiculous! How can I want to kill myself and not be aware of it? That's dumb. I deny it categorically." Uh, so I fought back, but the corporate media always was spinning the government story, and that's what they're doing with Petraeus right now. But what you see is that in the past year, we have the NDAA, we have the 
the, the, the executive order on privatization, or on, excuse me, on seizing private resources. We have the Department of Homeland Security manual. And now you have this very interesting brand new executive order on the part, the corporate partnership in this new martial law state where the corporations will be empowered by the government. They will be deputized by the government to impose their will on the people, and that to resist the corporation would be a, a crime, okay? And so you have somebody like Petraeus, and I imagine these other generals whom I have, I'm, I can tell you already, if they're standing up for America against this kind of thing, I'm, I want them in the military. We need them in the military. Um, that, that they would be resistant to this and fighting against this kind of military, excuse me, not a military, it's, it's, it's a defense of posse comitatus is what it is, um, that the military shall never be used as a police against, to police the people, but shall only be used for protection of the people. And um, if, if you have a government that is, is determined, like an Obama administration that's determined to implement corporate fascism and martial law, then... You know, a general like Petraeus, who I consider to have profound integrity, I, I have tremendous respect for him, though I am anti-war. I know he's a, obviously a brilliant strategist and tactician. Um, I think he's been restoring the integrity of the CIA and challenging the FBI over and over again. So I, I could see why they would view him as a threat. Uh, well, yeah, that's that's very interesting. Uh the NDAA, the the things that you were subjected to that that could well be uh, in the future for for many people that are out there speaking the truth at this time, uh, myself included, if if we yeah. aren't careful and don't turn the system around soon, and I mean sooner rather than later, um, it is fascinating to me that at this time we may actually have uh, a coup going on and and the American people be unaware of it. Um, in, in terms of, of General Petraeus himself and uh, this person who was there, the biographer, just out of curiosity, and, and you know, let me know if I'm detra you know, sort of veering off too much from, from your own experience or area of experience, but having been an insider the way you are, um, you, you would know that, you know, she, this person, I saw an article that said she was an intelligence asset, uh, and that indicates to me that she's probably an agent so that she's not quite just the uh, biographer, the, the quiet biographer. And uh, I, that does not mean that she's not, um, you know, a good person or an intelligent woman, uh, on the contrary. And she well could be being framed in, in this whole maneuver. Um, what I, I see this as very dirty that they're attacking her. Um, she is not a foreigner. She is absolutely has no attachments to any foreign intelligence agency. That would be the only time a honeypot scandal uh, is is where a foreign asset tries a female asset tries to bait a diplomat and tries to compromise the diplomats so that they can be blackmailed in some capacity or you know pillow talk can can produce intelligence that will be fed back to the foreign government that would be a very different situation i agree with you that broadwell uh... sounds to me like she was vetted for this job she was his biographer she was a trust somebody who he no doubt uh, had multiple individuals vetting her for this task um, before she was ever accepted, and so to say now that there was that she would have compromised him, I just don't believe that at all. And men and women do. If you've been married for ha for how many years was he married? Oh, it's a long time. I thirty-eight. Thirty-eight years, if I'm correct. I mean, you know, a man does that. I mean, a, a woman does that. This happens between, between in normal life. This is not. There's nothing. There's nothing scandalous about it. Uh, and certainly, you don't. You don't sacrifice the career of a brilliant general, who has who 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 is who is leading the CIA just because he has an affair with somebody who's not going to blackmail him anyway. The story that Broadwell that they invented that Broadwell. Uh, 
threatened her rival, that immediately collapses as well. And it also collapses that this Kelly woman had an affair with with, uh, with, with, the, with, with the general in, in Afghanistan. Uh, it's, it sounds like he was writing letters home. He was lonely. He had a friendly ear. And who can blame him for that? Come on. I mean, and, and he, again, even if they were, it's really nobody's business. Uh, it shows, and, and he denies it. He denies it. And, and nothing is ever, so, so what is the FBI doing reading 20,000 pages of email? Um, written home by a general to 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 a friend. Uh, that's a poor excuse for an investigation. And again, it shows the FBI is out to to get these guys. Now, as someone who's done black ops myself, um, I consider it very. I consider the FBI to be very threatening towards the functionality of the agency. You can be doing something that is entire, entirely beneficial, valuable, supremely valuable to the United States. And the FBI comes in, they want to take over whatever it is you're doing. They want to do it instead. They want to have their budget. Remember, this is bureaucracy and budget. It is who's going to control the, the sources, who's going to control um, the, the, the running of the missions, who's going to, you know, and, and, and they come in and they, you, you, you could easily go to, go to prison for these, for doing these good things. And I don't mean renditions. I don't mean things that where you're torturing people or committing crimes against people. That's a different matter. But, you know, the things I did were really great things. I was indicted for recruiting an Iraqi in the Muhabarat, who was a former diplomat, and uh, uh, he agreed to act as, a, as an informant on terrorists moving around the country. And they actually indicted me for this and said that it made me an Iraqi agent. And I was like, but the guy's going to be helping the United States. What are you talking about? But this is something that is normal intelligence work it is good intelligence work and yet they wanted to attack me for getting iraq's cooperation and they didn't want the cia involved in anti they didn't want the cia involved in anti-terrorism in iraq because the fbi wanted to take it the fbi is acting like a kgb in the united states and it's trying very hard to to push the cia out of international operations well let, so. me, let me back you up one second and ask you where homeland security uh fits into this scenario because in my understanding they're actually uh above both agencies yeah the gestapo right they are gestapo and unfortunately now, they are they are privatizing now. They, they're getting the corporations involved, so they're teaming up to, to turn the corporations against the American people. And I, a part, as a partnership, I would never have thought tw 10 years ago, even when I was going through something, this very thing, um, that, 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 that we could reach an impasse in the United States where this would even be possible. And to be honest with you, if you told me a Democrat was going to do it, I would have told you you were insane. I would never have believed it, even when I was locked up in prison. When, when, they, when my uncle told me that he was barred from entering the military base, and that they lied and said that there was no prison. I want you to remember, want you to think for a second of what that is actually like. Imagine the scenario that your family member has been taken away in the middle of the night by somebody who bangs on the door, get up out of bed, you're coming with us. They throw you in the back of a Jeep and the last you see is your husband or wife or daughter driving off into the night in handcuffs and shackles with a, with a bag over their head. You go looking in the base. Where is my child? Where is my daughter? Where is my husband? You go knocking on the door. Hello, is he here? Oh, we don't have a prison here. Oh, no, there's no prison on this base. I have lived that. There's no prison on this base. Your daughter is not here. Not at all. No, no, no. And, of course, my uncle, thank God we had, a, we had a court to go to. Under NDAA, there is no court. Okay. Uh, Lem, so, ultimately, what you did to get out of prison, uh, how long were you actually in prison? Was it five years, or was, were you just under, 
uh, I don't know, whatever kind of charges for five years? Um, I, uh, I was in prison for one year. The only reason, and, and everybody who's thinking of donating to Project Camelot, I don't want you to listen to this. The only reason I was released was that Internet Radio, it was not even the blogs, it was Internet Radio, began to do interviews with my companion, Jay Fields. And he could not even say that he was my lover. He just said that he lived with me in my house because we had this, this was an, a weird intelligence war. After he after he moves into with me, he got a job at the Pentagon, and then he moved over to the State Department. Okay, and he gets a top secret security clearance after he moves in with the Iraqi agent. So the deal was that he would never say that he was my lover publicly, but they knew that he was defending me publicly, and so. He forced this on the internet radio, brought this story to the internet radio, and that created blowback to get my release. And okay, Susan, we're going to have to break in here. We'll be right back. This is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot, Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Susan Lindauer. Uh, Susan, I wanted to ask you a question in regard to this whole Petraeus matter. Uh, because I, I understand from something that Tom Hennigan wrote that uh, Petraeus was apparently going to be uh, pointing the finger at the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, who has just stepped down, as you may know, um, for ordering the, the military to stand down uh, while the, the Libyan ambassador, Christopher Stevens, was being assassinated, um, and that that assassination was bought and paid for by the U.S. government uh, or, or, or elements in the government. Uh, what do you say to that? Um, I think it's bigger than that. I think that, uh, again, I think it's, it's something to hang this on uh, that, that, that perhaps makes more sense than the, the Broadwell ridiculous love affair, Broadwell love affair. But I think also um, he would be able to testify about that regardless of Hillary Clinton. And um, he, 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 if anything, he, he'd be a good scapegoat. They, they could they could turn that around and make him a scapegoat, so they could hang him for that as well. They could find a way to use that against him, uh, and they're not doing it. Um, I think I think it's bigger. I think that this has to do when when you. I think it's more accurate to say that this is a coup. And the reason it's a coup is that the military is on is is way ahead is five steps ahead of us. The CIA is five steps ahead of us, ten steps ahead of us, uh, and they know very well what's coming down the pike, and they are already resisting it uh, because because in fact cases like mine already show the abuses of, of regular citizens who are intel who happen to be intelligence people who've been subjected to these things already. And that we are the guinea pigs for what's happen going to happen to you. Uh, and the military is already sensitive to it to it to at a at a high level and they are conscious of the, the mass they know the master plan that that is underway and they're they're fighting against it is what I think is really going on. Okay. Uh, what about the notion that uh, that that Stevens was assa an assassination, a planned assassination? I mean, my understanding, I, I have to tell you, is is that based on everything I hear, that the Benghazi situation was was fairly orchestrated, that they let that ambassador go down, and that they had a reason for doing it. Uh, what that reason is, I don't know. Um, I don't know if you have any background on that, or even if you're going to be at liberty to say so. Well, I heard, I heard that that uh, Stevens was heavily involved in arming the Syrian uh, resistance to Assad, and that he. I heard that he was having dinner with the Turkish consulate right before his assassination, and that the uh, embassy security called in a war warning to Washington and said, hey, we're surrounded here. We've got hostels outside our door. What are we going to do? And no one, And they asked for help, of course, and no, no help came. And then as soon as the Turkish ambassador went out the front door uh, unscathed, 
um, un, unmolested. Um, as soon as he was gone and jumped into his truck and a car and drove away, um, having discussed f- financing and weapons supplies for the Syrian militia, the, the Sir, what is it? The Syrian National Congress and the free, the Syrian, the Free Syrian Liberation Army. Um, as soon as he, as soon as uh, the, the Turkish ambassador was gone, um, the, 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 the rebels, the Al Qaeda fighters, jumped out and killed Stevens. And you know that he was sodomized, right? Did you know that? Uh, no. I've seen pictures of that. He was. And what's the what's I mean? What's the you know significance of that? Well, I mean, the, this is this was an Al Qaeda attack. This was an Al Qaeda attack. Al Qaeda is 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 was created by the CIA. Of course, of course it was, and okay, it's so being funded by the CIA now. I mean, we brought the the United States, the Obama administration, brought Al Qaeda back to Libya, and now the Al Qaeda fighters have sort of turned on their master. Uh, or they're doing their master's bidding. But these are fighters who have been using, um, they, they, have, they, they were recruited by the United States, trained by the United States, imported to Libya by the United States. And they work for the United States. Right. And so it is, it is a fascinating thing that they should then turn around and assassinate the ambassador. Right. I mean, look, there, there, it sounds to me as though he was more or less a sitting duck I realized that he was involved in those in arms, uh, no doubt about it. Uh, yeah. And and whatever that entails, uh, and and certainly in the Middle East, you've got different different factions with different uh, sort of allegiances. Yeah. But you yourself have had uh, quite a background in 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 working with uh, the Middle East, right? Yeah. Uh, specifically in Iraq, in Libya. <laughs> I guess, but I don't know if other as- other areas of the Middle East. Were you in, uh, you know, other... Uh, Iraq, Libya, Yemen, Syria, Hezbollah, e- uh, and Egypt. Okay, so you're in a great position to evaluate this kind of uh, intelligence, so-called intelligence. Uh, and, and I have to say that there seems to be some kind of link uh, that, that is being drawn to, to what is called the, the Omega Fund and the LIBOR scandal uh i am not sure what the links are and 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 it seems a little you know kind of far-reaching but but there's probably something to it um and and then there's also i I, it's being claimed that the israeli Mossad uh were the ones that instigated the email hacking attack i mean um is this anything that you know anything about uh, the email hack? No, no, I don't. Uh, I don't know what, about that. About the email hacking attack. Uh, okay, L- let's say this: you you do write for veterans today, right now, isn't that? Right? Yes, yes. Okay, and and you must know Gordon Duff. Yes. Okay, and and Gordon Duff himself is an intelligence asset um, who often has disinformation. <laughs> who I love dearly, but he is often a source of disinformation too. As he puts it to me, whoever has the best story wins. Okay, and and you know I appreciate him. I have I had my conversations with him as well, and I have to say that you know I think people miss the point. You know, because they really do attack him in a big way for the disinfo. But I have to say, uh, the game is to figure out the truth, and that when these people put out the real truth, mixed with uh, disinfo as they do in in a press rag like Veterans Today, it is very. It's still very valuable. Because oh yes. Oh yes. A piece of truth. Uh, it's like a diamond in you know uh, among uh, you know a, a bunch of. De- Debris, absolutely, it's incredibly valuable. And oh, that- veterans today is fantastic. They, I love veterans today. I, I really do. Um, well, I think it's it's doing something no one else out there is doing. So you know, people have to have to recognize where you know uh, what what do you say in a time of, of deceit? It's it's a you know it's a, it's an act of courage to tell the truth. Whatever, um, it, it's a revolutionary act to tell the truth. I think is the paraphrasing, but. At any rate, you know, that's what seems to be happening. Uh, but there is something going on here because now Israel is attacking uh, Hamas. Not that they don't attack them periodically all the time, but apparently this is sort of an escalated um, attack. 
and uh, and I'm not sure where that goes in in the, sort of with this backdrop in mind. Well, well, he, but here's here's what's going on on a global scale. Israel has has uh, launched an attack on the Golan Heights in Syria, so they're essentially uh, drawing Iran into a proxy war with. Syria, there you, because Iran get, uh, Syria gets its weapons support from Iran, and so they're trying to find another way, a creative strategy. If you can't take the direct route to war with Iran, if you can pull, if you can pull Iran into Syria and then catch Iran doing something that would upset Israel, they can dr- pull us all into a World War Three scenario, and then you have somebody like General Petraeus who is an operational tactical genius who is getting the CIA back up and running. And he has perhaps a different philosophy on what the military should be doing for the United States. And he he may, and I'm giving him a benefit of the doubt here because I do respect him so much and because I do think this is a coup, that he would be defending posse comitatus. And you have a situation where the Israelis and the Obama administration are trying to open a path to war with Iran, and they know there will be powerful resistance at home when that happens, and they're laying out the whole groundwork where they can seize private assets to use it for the war effort. They can use the corporations, they can deputize corporations to hold citizens in control and 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 have military authority and and then you have somebody like general petraeus who has the tradition of the military at heart and you have his other generals who you talk about who who you've talked about who have been forced to step down or they've even been arrested and that tells me that somebody is defending the american people and we may be closer to martial law than you realize Yes. Or not that you realize, but that the general public real you realize it, you get it, <laughs> but that you do, you, you know, your audience totally gets it. But I think we're a lot closer than we think. Yeah, I, I have. We may be just a few months away. Yes, uh, true. Just, just out of curiosity, you you got out of prison. You then pursued your case. I take it in the courts. Is that right? Well, they they refused to give me a trial. For five years, I was held under indictment. Um, what happened was we forced them to release me um, because they, they, they judged me a case. It, when the, when uh, blowback from the blogs was so powerful that Judge Mukasey, the, 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 they realized they, could, they were not going to be able to do this quietly like they hoped because the corporate media had now a rival in the blogs and the Internet radio. And so they, they were forced to let me go. But then for the next two years, two and a half years, I continued under indictment. And every single month, they tried to take me back into custody. Uh, I was actually forced to go into court with no attorney present to fight a bail revocation. They invented all sorts of ridiculous stories to try to pull my bail. And it always had to do, it was always timed with, you know, big, powerful um, pushes that I was making in the media. And the more the media covered me, the more the Internet media covered my story, when I was finally speaking, after my release from prison, I just started talking. I was like, you know, what do I have to lose? You know, I can't rely on other people to tell my story because they don't get it because it's too complicated. So I went out and started speaking. Every month they tried to take me back into custody. And it it became this, uh, my case only ended five days before the Obama inauguration. And the the irony is that, you know, the the Republicans presumed that Obama would, would, um, would would be sympathetic to me because I was demanding a trial. But in fact, Obama would have been just as awful because he's prosecuted more whistleblowers than the Republicans. So I probably would not have been safe under Obama either. And and he's the one who's going to implement martial law if, we, if it comes to that. Okay, but, well, okay, with your insider uh, sort of access, though, let me ask you, uh, are you not aware of, of just how far the tentacles of the Bush cabal reach? In other words... Oh, absolutely, yes. Oh, burrowed in deep. So, yes. Insiders in Washington must know 
that Obama is not calling the shots. Oh, absolutely. I agree with you a thousand percent. Yeah. A thousand yeah. percent. And I'm going to tell you something right now that, um, that I, I cannot elaborate on. But, for example, we have, remember the money that, was, that the, the Pentagon lost? The $2.3 trillion. Yeah. Okay. We have found that money. We know where it is. I know where it is. I know the bank account where it is. I know the bank, and I and this and I, we we and I'm not going to say that who who where it is and the names and everything over the radio right now, but I will tell you that we could have had this back uh, 18 months ago, and it's no longer 2.3 trillion. It's more like 10 or 10 trillion dollars or higher, which would wipe out the federal deficit. Right. Okay, and there's also gold, gold bullion, okay. tens of thousands of metric tons of gold bullion, okay. and we don't necessarily have a financial crisis, but isn't it interesting that we can't get that money back? Uh, well, is that linked to the gold global settlements, or is it, it being stashed somewhere uh, offshore? Are we talking the Philippines or somewhere else? Uh, foreign, Asia. Okay. That's what I'll tell you. Foreign Asia, but I, but but you, but you see, we could, we could, and hopefully we will uh, get that money back for America, and then you don't have a f fiscal crisis anymore. We can end this crisis without tax cuts. Excuse me, without without excuse me, without tax increases or sequestration. Uh, you know, budget cuts in the Pentagon and the domestic budget, uh, cuts to Social Security. We don't have a crisis. And they could have done this 18 months ago as of February, and do, do, I want to be real precise about this, as of February and March of 2011, the fiscal crisis breaks on the scene in July of 2011. In August of 2011, the uh, U.S. loses its credit rating, its, its sterling credit rating. We get not dropped down a notch. Right. Uh, no doubt about that. Uh, okay, this is Carrie Cassidy, Project Camelot Whistleblower Radio, and we're talking to Sin Susan Lindauer. Uh, Susan, right before the break, I, I guess uh, we were still going down the Petraeus matter and, and what was going on with Stevens, uh, the link up to to possibly uh, what is going on here in the United States, uh, a coup. Let me ask you this, uh, whether you think that it, in light of the people, you know, the generals that are being sort of raked over the coals and some of them losing uh, a lifetime of, of, of you know, I, I guess, you know, sh shoulder insignia and so on and so forth. Um, Well-earned people, who we, men who are the bravest, the best and the bravest, yes, who earn yes. those stripes. Absolutely. But but in light of that, um, you know, because just because these people are being sort of uh, skewered in the media because the media is so brain dead, they don't look, look beyond uh, uh, their noses to see what's really going on. Um, let's say that this 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 situation has legs. Uh, I mean, as long as they're not in jail, aren't they, at, you know, in a position to still uh, affect change? Uh, and, and if yes, they, yes, they are in a position, and that's why they're trying to disgrace them and discredit them as much as they can so that they will be tied up in fighting these ridiculous allegations and they won't and people will be distracted by the stupid part uh, what we agree are stupid arguments i do not believe honestly that it's benghazi i see benghazi as as a uh you know and a, a lot of people who oppose the libyan war and i was one of them uh, are throwing out benghazi but i don't see that as as the crisis that they're saying it is i think this is much worse <laughs> i believe that the generals that they're attacking have two share two common value systems. One, they are opposed to unnecessary wars with Iran. And, and, and you know, uh, uh, Joint Chiefs Martin uh, Dempsey uh, came out powerfully against the war, put his foot down, said, no way are we going into another re unnecessary war in the Middle East. We cannot fight this. We cannot win. Our military is exhausted and broken. We refuse and so they're fighting them. They're fighting back to defend their soldiers. At the same time, 
on the home front, the, the, the Obama administration is getting ready to implement a martial law scenario. And unfortunately, I don't think that that is an extremist statement. Um, the fiscal, I, 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 tragic, I see it as a great tragedy, and ordinarily when people say, oh, they're looking for martial, they're setting up a, a, a scenario for martial law, they're setting up an infrastructure for martial law, I think that's a conspiracy theorist, theorist nutcase accusation. However, it certainly looks that way. There's, they are laying out the groundwork. And then you add in what I know for a fact, because, Carrie, I have the papers in my house. I have been given the papers. I know where the accounts are. We have the money. There is no fiscal crisis. I know the, I was given the papers, and I'm telling you this because you are Project Camelot. I was given the papers by someone who is trying to return the money to the feds and has been trying to, for the past 18 months, give the money back. First, unfortunately, he ran into the neocon, a neocon team. I know who they are. I know who the the principals who were involved. I know them by name. And they played a game with him and pretended they were going to give the money back. Then they sidelined him and said, well, maybe you don't need to do that. Maybe you could keep, the, you could give the money to us and we could use the money for black ops, for our black bag operations, because it's a private security firm. And so instead of helping him give back the money, because he's trying to do it kind of covertly, he's trying to hide where it has been, well, I know that, and he's trying to hide who's been helping him hide the money. He's trying to conceal this information so that he is not totally exposed and his, uh, what do you call them, uh, the, the accomplices who have aided and abetted in this theft are not exposed. So he's trying to use people who are outside the agency but know how the agency works to give back the money. I've known about this since February, and we have run into the biggest trouble the banksters have been fighting this. They don't want the money going back to the United States either. And it seems like the, 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 the most extraordinary thing, because I'm telling you something that it's, it seems impossible, but in the next few weeks uh, it's going to turn out to have been true, because if, if necessary I would go to the media and release the documents. If they, if they don't break down and if they actually go through with this cliff, fiscal cliff, then I promise you uh, this information will be on the blogs. I will put it out there. I've got it. I'll put it out there. There is no fiscal crisis. So who is manufacturing this whole scenario and for what, what purpose? And that's the thing you've got to ask yourself. That, I mean, that get it, gets into the whole uh, sort of Rothschild agenda, New World Order scenario, and, uh, and we haven't even talked about the Chinese. Uh, I, I, w I would like to draw your attention to the white hats uh, that do a blog called uh, The Dark darkcabalblogspot.com, where they've been releasing on a regular basis documents uh, all about following the money. I wrote a, a very long article to accompany some of their releases. Uh, they've got some very important stuff surrounding an, a, a something called Pure Heart Investments, which is a, a basically the head of sort of a a, a trading program that, that the Bush Cabal uses and has used to, to raise huge amounts of money. You must know about these trading programs. Uh, oh, yes. Yes. Oh, oh, I do. I've learned about them. Right. Yes. So, so what, let me ask you, I mean, because if you want to give documents to someone, I can definitely tell you they're the people to give them to. They've been releasing this kind of thing for quite a while. Well, well, first of all, what we're going to try to do, we're going to continue to try to do it a straight way uh, to get the money back to the government. Uh, because some of, it, of this is the type of scenario where I know this, that the gentleman who's got the money is, is most afraid of being exposed. So he would prefer to do this in a way that he can stay out of it when it comes out and uh, that, that he can hide from public scrutiny. Uh, and I... I, I know that all of you want that information, and it, there may come a time when it has to be done. Uh, but in my opinion, it's more important to get the money back. 
And okay. so if he's willing to, you know, if we, could, if, we can cut, if we can eliminate the federal deficit, and that's what I'm talking about, it'll drop by $10 trillion. But the Fed is filled with, with, with Bush cabal. I mean, you, you yeah. know this, right? And it's been ba- basically being taken over, at, as we speak, from what I understand, by the Treasury right yeah. now. Have you heard this? Yes. Oh, I believe, yes. Okay. Yeah. And and some people are being put in position, uh, I understand from back channel sources, uh, that are honest. But most of those people are, you know, are basically bought and paid for. And so yeah. if you give them the money, I, I have to say that um, that you may just, it, it will, it, it's very likely to disappear completely. Well, that is a real concern. This is, yeah. This is this is uh, something that we have been uh, struggling with to make sure that they, that it really goes to the American people, and that's why I'm willing to you know go on go on record you know go go on record and tell someone like you because I know you have a very sophisticated audience, and that's not a platitude. Um, a lot of my my feelings about the Patriot Act and the NDAA I, are very emotional. As you can tell from this interview, and Carrie, I, I apologize that it's not not everything I'm saying to you tonight is 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 distant and objective because to me it's like this raw emotion of what I suffered and lived through and having been strip searched and shackled when I was going into court and Larry Silverstein's attorneys were coming out while they were getting the seven billion dollars for the World Trade Center and I was weeping weeping frantically hysterically that we knew about the 9-11 attack and it would have killed his his financial compensation my judge was hearing the same case so it's Everything that I have experienced, I have experienced as a pers- on a deeply personal level. And okay. so sometimes I do an interview and I, I get emotional, and I shouldn't, but it's, it's hard not to. Okay, Susan, we've got one caller. We've got very limited time. I, I first want to uh, want to thank you for your service to humanity. Um, I, I want to also say to you that if, if you have such things in your house, I hope you've backed them up and given them uh, in packages to other people. Uh, yes. So that they're- copies and duplicates everywhere because obviously uh, you're a person who has that kind of background I don't think you would be stupid about this right absolutely okay and and if anything ever happened to me if I was ever arrested or assassinated they would come out immediately that's the that's how it's being set up right now uh, because I am afraid that I I don't want to be tagged with stealing money from the federal government or in any way concealing money when I'm trying to get it back. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, now uh, I'm going to take this caller. Uh, caller, it's uh, area code 443. Sorry we haven't been able to get to other callers. You're on the air with Susan Lindauer and Carrie Cassidy. Uh, oh, wow. Okay, uh, I guess we missed it. Um, the music is starting. Susan, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, we, the caller wasn't seeming to come on the line. Uh, I don't know what's going on with that. Please give your, uh, if you have a website, if you have a blog, whatever you would like, uh, name of your book, please please do so at the, right now. Thank you. Uh, my book is Extreme Prejudice, The Terrifying Story of the Patriot Act and the Cover-Ups of 9-11 in Iraq. I, it goes into every terrorism case that we worked on uh, and the real story of the, the nightmare of my imprisonment on Carswell Air Force Base. And uh, stay strong, everybody. Stay bold. And we're going to beat these guys. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, it's been a joy to have you on the show, and let's do this again. 